Okay, hello everybody and welcome to the Filipino Freethinkers podcast. It's also a video. I'm Red and today we're doing another conversation for a cause, this time with Peter Bogosian and he's the author of this book. It's very good. I haven't read all of it, but um, it looks very interesting and I look forward to practicing some of the tools and techniques here, which we are going to talk about in a bit. So, Peter, um, hi. Hi, thanks for having me on, and thanks for having uh, read the book. How did you get an actual copy of the book? Um, we had a friend who came from the U.S., and um, you, when the first time I heard about your book, I was already very interested in it, and I, and I made sure that that friend of ours, hi, Ria, thank you for getting us a copy of the book. Thank you. Give us a copy. So... It would be uh, cool if you could actually sign it. I, I mean, uh, if we could meet someday, I look forward to that. I would love that. I would love that. Thank you. That's very kind of you to say. Yeah, so the book is a bestseller. And um, wh why do you think that is? What sets it apart from the others in the genre? And do you think that it's being a bestseller signals a shift in society, that such a book would be in relatively high demand? That's a good question. Um, it, it's been selling very well. We keep having to print copies, and then we, every time we, we, we print copies, they uh, they sell out. Uh, I think no, nobody has written a book that teaches people how to talk people out of faith and into reason. And so I think it's new, it's novel. Uh, I think the, it, it's uh, writing off of the experience of uh, multiple domains of thought. And I think the people who read it in the initial crop really liked it. And so, as a friend of mine said, the, the harder you work, the less you have to rely on luck. So I worked really, really hard for a really, really long time. And then that's the result of uh, 20 plus years of uh, serious scholarly labor. And not just that, but my experience in engaging people too. You gotta, excuse me, my room is freezing cold. I'm in my office right now, and for some reason the heater doesn't work, so I'm, I'm all bundled up. But, uh, so the room, the, the, the book is a product of, uh, of uh, many, many year decades of uh, experience. And my goal with the book, I don't know if it signals a shift in society or not. I, I hope that people use the tools in the book, and I hope it does a lot of people some good. That's my goal. Yeah, um, most of the books that I've read in the genre usually talk about how you would debate uh, an apologist in an academic setting or in, a, in an online forum, perhaps. But yours um, can be applied to more context, um, everyday life of, uh, of atheists and, and free thinkers everywhere. Um, what do you think are the advantages of your approach to the usual approach of debating um, as if you'd be talking to religious apologists? Yeah, that's a good question. So the idea is specifically not to debate anybody. So these conversations should be intervention. So you, you're looking at it as intervening and helping somebody with the way they form beliefs, their belief forming mechanism, but it is absolutely positively not a debate. The, the disadvantage of a debate is that it entrenches people in the beliefs they have. They get more skilled at arguing those beliefs for those beliefs. It doesn't change anybody's mind. It doesn't help anybody. It doesn't further the dialogue, but it, it deepens people's delusions and uh, it, it's not a productive way if we want to help people to shed those delusions. It's not, debating isn't the way to do it. Okay, um, you call your strategy street epistemology. Now, can you tell us a bit about how you came up with the name and maybe also a gist of the approach, an elevator pitch? Sure. My, uh, one of my students, Ryan, tossed the, the term out, and that's where it kind of stuck with me. But I'll bottom line it, uh, epistemology is how you know what you know, and street epistemology is, this is good for the street, it's good on the street, it's good with people in every context. I've been in the prisons, I've been in multiple, I mean, overcrowded public universities. It's good in every, every context that you are in, you can help people to think more reliably, and you can talk them into reason and out of faith. 
Yeah, um, in the book, you talk about several experiences that you had using the approach. Um, did you do any formal study on on each of the of the times that you did this? Because you know, statistics would be really interesting in this uh, in this case. Yeah, would well, I'm not allowed to, to to do something like that. You need IRB approval, and that's in Chapter Nine. And I didn't have eth ethical approval to do that, so I I wasn't allowed. However, I will. I'm coming out with a TV show. It's called The Reason Whisperer, and I'm going to yeah, I'm gonna catch people as they come out of a mega church or synagogue or mosque, and I'm going to talk them into reason and out of faith, and then we're going to explain at each stage how it's done, and hopefully that will give, the, give people, it'll be in, engaging, uh, my, that's my hope, but it will teach people, how to, they can see this process with their own eyes, and then they'll be able to use it. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to that, uh, and and also I'm still looking forward to a kind of study um, that would pass the ethical standards and and all that. But um, informally, can you tell me about like let's say the success rate of of your interventions at least, or the people you know who have tried the interventions? Like give a give a rough estimate, a ballpark figure of the you know the the number of people you've. You successfully convinced or, or disabused, and what's well, the success rate? That's a, those are, you're right. First of all, you're absolutely right. You really need some kind of a study on that. I don't foresee in the next few years the system changing so that one could get ethical approval to study that. In the United States, at least, you have to go through something called the IRB, which is also referred to as human subjects. It, it's, it, yeah, it's difficult to, to say what the success rate is. So in the book, I talk about the trans-theoretical model, and it, I gave a talk at Imagine No Religion 3 where I talked about that, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to move people on a scale of belief, people who do not want their beliefs changed. And so first you ascertain or you figure out how close they are, and then all you try to do is move them one tier to be more open, to be to embrace doubt more, to be less certain and less dogmatic. So sometimes I know that I, I've had a successful intervention when people seem to become more entrenched or more cemented in their beliefs. Um, so let's see. So some, sometimes it really it doesn't appear to work. Sometimes it appears to achieve the opposite effect, which is that I know it's working. But, but you know, thinking about the TV show now, when, we when we're following up with people, and one, one of the difficulties is even if you could do it on the spot, which it's not actually that difficult to do. It's, in fact, it's more difficult, it's, it's easier to do than you think. The problem is that people get drawn back into these faith communities. And when they're drawn back into the faith communities, uh, they're told things, I read about this in the book, like, oh, just pray about it, which is a type of confirmation bias, which got them in this situation in the first place. So even if I gave you a success rate, and I'll throw out some guesses later on, even if I gave you a success rate, the problem is, it's very difficult to know if that success rate sticks. Mm. <coughs> Excuse me, so... You could be successful, they could go back into their communities and then they, they could, um, th their faith could, the faith virus could reinfect them. So, yeah, so, so, so it's, it's difficult, but, but I would say uh, to instill some kind of doubt at any stage of the trans-theoretical model, uh, if I were to just give a number, I'd say 75%. It's not. It's not. It's not that difficult to do. Now, this to move people multiple stages. That's very difficult to do, but that's not the goal. The, the goal isn't to. Uh, the, the, you, you can you can only help people so much. So yeah, I'd say, I'd say about maybe even higher than seventy five percent. I don't know, 80 percent, eighty five percent to move people on one stage. There are contexts which make that more difficult. So we're gonna do a. He probably won't see this, so I can tell you. We found a youth pastor, and I think it's going to be pretty easy to move him, but yet he's so vested in it. He's so stuck in those beliefs. I mean, he's radically entrenched in the pre-contemplative stage. So, um, 
so so yeah again i i, I really don't i can't give you a percent but if, if i were if i were forced i would say about 75 80 percent chance of on any given intervention that you'll move people one stage and the people who don't move uh i've actually run into them again and i've totally switched it up and then once i switch it up and get a feel for them then that number increases Hmm. Okay, in your experience, like these interventions, how long do they take? How fast could a, could a successful intervention potentially be? And how slow? Uh, uh, in your experience, how long have you uh, um, spent time on someone? Yeah, the, intervention? the last one we got on film, uh, I wasn't even thinking of doing it. And we got it on film for someone. It took about... Uh, and then the producer said, hey, why don't you ask if there are any people of faith there? And we did. Uh, so the last one took about uh, five to seven minutes. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty quick. Well, yeah, yeah. I, just on that, so, so if I have a little more time to set the scene, if, if I have a little more time, then I can increase the likelihood of success. So if I have about 15 or 20 minutes, but often I just don't have the time to do that. So I've, I had to do these, these uh, condensed versions. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, something about uh, people being more invested and, and also about them going back to their faith communities and being yeah. infected with the virus. Like, it's a big what, problem. In your yeah. experience, is the most, the most common barrier and at the same time, what's the what's the most difficult barrier that you've encountered? These are good questions. The most common barrier are um, friends and family who reinfect the person I've just helped. The so that's the most common barrier. The most difficult barrier is uh, Dan Dennett's belief and belief. And didn't you speak to Dan Dennett? Yeah, it's the idea that I did. Yeah, yeah, he's a cool guy. Um, it is the idea that um, that people think they should have it and it's important for them to have it. So sometimes, like the youth pastor, I'm going to try to help him by disassociating uh, faith from virtue, faith from from being a good person. And then, then once it's isolated in that sense, then we can hone in on faith specifically faith as a way to know the world um so yeah so i think that's the most the most difficult barrier uh, aside from you know as i said the communities and reinfecting etc is the most difficult barrier just with an in, in individual isolated yes it is communities yes it's all those things but in the context of that particular intervention it is that people think that faith is a virtue so we we've, we've spoken about these these powerful barriers um, what on the other hand is the most powerful tool of all of the tools in the book what would you say is the one that's most effective in the most cases these are good questions uh, I have to think you're gonna have to see I have to think about that um, I don't know I don't think it's a particular question I think it's uh, I think it's the, the most powerful tool in the book is sincerity mm. if you're if yeah if you're incredibly sincere with people and you say exactly what you mean and you never say anything you don't mean and uh i had an intervention um the other day and this woman kind of mentioned in passing about a bear coat and i just found it so fascinating i just kept asking her questions about the bear coat the intervention got a little sidetracked but it's vital to develop rapport that way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for that. Um, in the book, you advise atheists or people or street epistemologists to avoid getting into the argument about benefits, right? Like, Absolutely. Talk about the benefits of faith and just vital. On, the, on whether the truth claim is true itself. Yeah. Um, but it is an effective argument for theists, which is why they, they keep on using it. Um, don't you think arguing for the positive benefits of atheism could work independent of whether or not atheism is is true? No, I don't. I, I don't. I don't think. 
again, in the context of an intervention. Now, in the context of a debate, that might be very different. In, I mean, it depends what your objective is, but in the context of an intervention, so, so I also feel this way about, I don't think I wrote this in the book, but I also feel this way about the problem of evil. In fact, I feel this, this way about everything except, there's only one question you need to know. Is faith a reliable guide to reality? How does someone know that? And then there are tools for dissecting and analyzing that, and there are ways to give people those tools. Uh, so no, I don't, although, although on the rarest of occasions it has happened to me where people have said, you know what, my faith is not an accurate guide to reality, but we're far better off if more people have faith. Okay, great. Once people have explicitly acknowledged that, then I'm happy to have that conversation, but not until then. And, and I, well, can I say one more thing about that? Oh, sure, sure. Go ahead. I'm going to make I'm going to make a prediction to you. If you stick to the strategy, I've now got it down to about 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes. If you stick to exactly the template of a use in the book, the vast majority of people will switch to the benefit argument between 10 and 15 minutes because they have to. There's nothing else they can say. What else are they going to say? So they'll switch to the benefit argument that faith is beneficial or religion is good for communities. They won't say, hey, we're going to switch. I talked about this in my Easter Bunny talk. They'll kind of try to pull a fast one. Uh, but they have to do that because there's nothing else they can, there's no defense. There's no defense to assigning a higher confidence value than the evidence warrants. So then you have to fill that gap between what's warranted by the evidence and you have to fill that gap with, ah, but if you do that, it will be beneficial to people. Hmm, I agree. And, uh, and I agree completely with you that um, teaching people a good epistemology that gets them closer to the truth as much and uh, as often as possible is a value in itself. But um, that being said, there are those, of course, who will ask, um, what's the end point? Like, um, um, so what if they become atheists in the end? What, what is the benefit of that? And to these people, what would your answer be? I couldn't possibly care less whether or not people become atheists or not. Um, I, I don't. I don't think that being an atheist confers any special privilege on people. I don't think it makes you smarter. I don't think it makes you more skeptical. DJ Grutti has said repeatedly that one can be. People are atheists. Uh, but yet they believe in woo. They believe in pseudoscientific silliness. Uh, so that's why I repeatedly advocate not going after God, but going after the way people form beliefs. If you can help people form beliefs reliably, then all of the conclusions that come from those processes can be undermined simultaneously. You can take out the whole thing, like the, the I say in the book, like the, the foundation of the house. You take down that one support beam, all of the beliefs come crashing, and if one of those beliefs happens to be God, all right, all the, all the better, but but that's why you shouldn't target God. You should, you should target the unreliable ways of thinking. Again, it's, it's less about Atheists, people will come to atheism once they have reliable ways to think about reality. Okay. Uh, tell us a bit about your story. Like, were you ever a believer and did you have a self-intervention or did someone else help you reach the conclusion that you have now? No, I, I was never a believer. I, uh, uh... I've been doing, I've been teaching critical thinking for so long, I've been doing it for so long in so many contexts that somebody asked me, well, what's, what's one thing, what's one thing you've taken away after having taught all these classes? Man, I thought about that question, I thought about that question, and then I came to the conclusion that people don't have evidence to warrant their confidence. And then I started thinking about that in terms of um, the biggest the biggest, most egregious, big, the biggest danger that we have in terms of thinking and, and the biggest toxin. And I thought to myself, well, clearly it's faith. Um, <clears throat> and everything after that point just kind of clicked together. Hmm. So no, I was never, I was never religious. Yeah. No, never. So let's talk a bit about the terms that you use in the book and uh, that you've used in this uh, conversation. You've called faith a virus. Yeah. And of course, everyone who is infected with that virus is infected. Yeah. Um, you call the conversion process an intervention. Um, and some would argue that, that you perhaps uh, treat people like patients and therefore you know, you, you, you think you know what's better for them. So isn't this all 
a bit condescending and is having that kind of uh, attitude um, a healthy attitude when you're condescending towards other people no co condescension towards people is never healthy and I specifically advocate in chapter 4 uh, what what these interventions are and what they're not. The, the thing that w when religious apologists who don't like the book, the thing that they conveniently re <clears throat> remove from the book or, or uh, leave out of their arguments is that I advocate for belief or vision. So if you're talking to somebody and they know something you don't know, first thing you should do is admit that you don't know what you don't understand. And then the second thing that you should do Excuse me, I think I'm catching a cold. And the second thing that you should do is you should be open and willing to revise your beliefs. And and that's part of the problem with faith and dogmatism. Part of the problem is that people who are infected by the faith virus, they think that having this this unreliable, this, these delusions, these, this unreliable way to think about reality, they think that that somehow serves them or suits them or makes them better people. So they don't want to revise their beliefs. And I'm advocating for belief revision as the core. And that's not my idea. I mean, that's the American Philosophical Association's ideal critical thinker, which, since you have the book, that's, I think it's index A or B in the book, yeah. So our group um, is a free-thinking organization, so we have all sorts of people with all, all sorts of beliefs. We have many theists, many people who still believe in something spiritual or something pseudo-scientific even. Um, but we, we focus more, like you do, on the process of thinking, on how people uh, come to conclusions. Now, uh, with everything that you've written and everything that you've said, do you think that it's really impossible for someone to use their reasoning powers to the fullest to use you know their scientific critical thinking and arrive at a conclusion that there is a God that's a good question uh, I don't see how that would po be possible because I don't see what evidence could lead one there people would have to resort to internal feeling states that they feel something I mean there's certainly look if there were if the question would be settled and Dan Barker uh, talks about this then we wouldn't have need debates but because we people get I mean the whole idea of apologetics you, you don't have you know gravity apologetics I mean you, 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 I, I don't know how it would be possible to someone to come to the conclusion that God exists uh, as a warranted belief. You have to rely on some internal feeling state. But, <coughs> excuse me, as internal feeling states aren't reliable guides to reality, then it's not clear to me how someone could come to that conclusion. But I'm open. I mean, I'm open if someone has a, a new argument that I haven't heard yet. Uh, I'm certainly open to listen to that. Yes, uh when you fail at an intervention, uh, do you think it reflects more on the patient or the doctor or the medicine itself? That's a great, these are great questions. Uh, not the medicine. Uh, sometimes the doctor, sometimes the patient. It, so, you know, these interventions, they're very, very complicated things. And you're trying to, in a very brief period of time, help somebody to align their beliefs with reality when they have suffered in many cases years and years and years of cognitive damage Ye I mean I mean sometimes even decades and so in the person in the book HD um, uh, those that intervention has failed repeatedly and I've been trying that for years uh, so I think it's a combination of a bunch of variables um, and, you know sometimes you just have to mix up your approach sometimes when you get to know somebody better after a second or a third meeting um, sometimes that's effective I don't I, it's it's hard to say uh, it's usually that, that, that maybe sometimes that people have a very virulent strain of the virus. I, I'll give you an example if I may. I have the, the lowest success rates, and I was thinking of, I don't have time to do this, but I've been toying with the idea of writing a book just about this. For there's some reason, there's something very difficult about Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't know why, I don't know what it is. Uh, but I think I've only had one successful intervention with Jehovah's Witnesses. It, it is by far my lowest percentage. 
And I don't, I don't know why. I don't think it's the doctor. I don't think it's the medicine. There must be something about the, that strain of the virus that's just so virulent. It's so damaging to one's cognitions that it just it just must seed itself in the brain or something. I don't really know what. I, I don't I don't know how to tr- how to think about it. But um, but yeah, there are some people. There are some strains of the virus that are extremely difficult to dislodge. That's uh, certainly very, very interesting because uh, here in our country, we don't have much experience with, uh, or at least I do not have much experience with uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, but from what I've read about them, they're kind of very extreme about the beliefs that they hold, and they they hold on to those beliefs despite much evidence that's presented to them. Um, and this is particularly what people hate about fundamentalists and extremists. They, they cling to their beliefs and, and they also tend to not keep their religion to themselves and, you know, go out of their way to influence others or, or in your words, to infect others with their faith. Um, but um, how do you respond to charges that in this way, uh, new atheists or militant atheists are no different from fundamentalists or extremists? That's such an um, unusual question. I just watched Stefan Molyneux's rebuttal of that hack, that hatchet job that someone did on from from the, the uh, piece in Canada, who clearly did not read the book. Uh, he said a few things that were really interesting. He said, um, uh, he said he's a good guy. He said uh, in one interview, he said faith is like a backwards roadmap. You have all of these people trying to get to the, they're trying to get to the destination, but the map they have them there, the epistemology is actually taking them away from their destination. Um, the, the, the other thing he said was, let, let's say that somebody says the, the or earth is shaped like a banana. And you help them, you show them evidence that the earth isn't shaped like a banana. It's shaped like a sphere. So there's a matter of fact about the world, the earth, excuse me. Does that mean that they were converted? I, I see street epistemology as a type of education. I don't see it as a type of evangelism, and it's weird when people say that it's a type of evangelism. I have yet to hear one type of evangelism that talks about the importance of revising your beliefs. So I look at it more as an educational campaign and an epistemological campaign uh, and, and a way to help people to reason more reliably. I see. You mentioned also in the book that you, you oftentimes actively look for opportunities for these interventions. And you I see do. religious symbols like people wearing crosses and other uh, religious uh, symbols as kind of like targets that, you know, there's a bullseye. I'm going to go after this person. Now, what's the farthest you've gone out of your way to try to do an intervention with someone? Uh, well, let me c- correct something you say for me. It's not going after a person. I'm not going after any people. I, I talk about beliefs. I do this because I want to help people. I mean, I'd much rather be doing something more productive. I mean, if if the faith fire, if I if we are successful in eradicating the faith fires. Well, then I, I feel like one of those little sucker fish in a tank that cleans out all the gunk and the, the bad, the yucky stuff. Um, I would love to work on other aspects of philosophy, environmental problems, ecological problems, racial hatred. Uh, so, so, uh, so, yeah, it's not about going after people. This is about helping people. It's not going after anybody. Uh, so the furthest that I've gone out of my way. Uh, you mean like a single instant, a specific instant? Yeah, yeah, like you really thought you had to to do something or, you know, like it's, it's totally inconvenient for you and yet you went out of your way to to take the opportunity to try an intervention. Well, I, I'm a busy guy. Uh, twice, actually, at the same place at Costco, I, I saw, uh, once I saw a monk, and the other one, the other time I saw an Orthodox Jew, and I both waited behind them in longer lines to strike up conversations with them. Um, 
but I don't usually don't have to go out of my way too much since the vast majority of people in the society are infected. So they come to me. Um, sometimes I take my lunch and the park blocks and sit with the preachers and try to help them. Um, I don't think there are any particular times. I just think it's a way to live your life. Uh, yeah. So out of all of the interventions that you have done, like what for you was the most challenging? Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses in general. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, re I read that you kind of tried to do an intervention on your own mother. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so I thought long and hard when my, about my mom when uh, my mom was a wonderful, funny, irreverent, great woman and she had a rather um, painful death of cancer. Uh, and I didn't do an intervention on her when my dad asked her to bring a statue of the little baby Jesus about was about this big. I remember it from my childhood. Um, and so, you know, even though the, I have a book about that and this is kind of all I do, I couldn't bring myself to do that to help my mom uh, in her final hours, in her final days. So... You know, there are emotional things um, that make that really difficult. You know, my mom was great. Yeah, my mom was great. You know, she's an unbelievably good mom. And uh, I, I think this line that you did not cross, for many people, they, they draw these lines differently. Like, um, what do you think is a general, you know, like, past that point, it's no longer productive to try an intervention. Like, um, for some people, it could be, um, sickness for some people it could be extreme poverty or whatever kind of suffering do you think that that line exists where uh, street epistemologists should not even try to do an intervention okay so when you talk about interventions uh, and, and you, you could use the synonym develop a more reliable epistemology and mm -hmm. if, if the word epistemology is too weird for you or to, to a listener, instead of saying epistemology, you can say develop a better way to reason. So an intervention is a better way to reason. So when is it not appropriate or when is it inappropriate to help people develop better ways of reasoning? I don't know. Maybe the only time I can think of is when your mom is on when my mom is on her deathbed. Uh, the TV show that I'm going to do, uh, it's called The Reason Whisperer, and I walk into uh, mega churches, etc., and I I help people to deconvert themselves. But I'm going to do a series when I help uh, homeless drug addicts to uh, instead of p people preaching about Jesus to them, I'm going to try to help them to use uh, reason and rationality to make better choices. And I do a similar thing at Oregon Health Science University. See that, to get back to your earlier question, I don't need any research approval for because it's not a study. I'm not going to publish in a journal, so I don't need to get approval from anybody. Um, but if I were going to publish that, then I would need approval. So, I, I, yeah, so, so I don't, uh, I don't think it's, Again, the thing with my mom was more about my emotional state at the time due to my mom's cancer. Um, I don't think it's ever bad or almost never bad to help. I, I can't imagine it's really when, when, some, when having a reliable process of reasoning would ever be bad. Because that's the real hope that you give people. The ho hope comes from reason. Hope doesn't come from superstition and delusion. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for sharing that that uh, story about your mother. Yeah. And speaking of parents, um, a lot of the members in our group, um, one big problem that they, they have to overcome is coming out to their parents. Because a lot of the times, these parents see their kids turning into atheists as failures that reflect on how bad they were as parents. So what kind of advice would you give to, to a young atheist who doesn't who not only wants to come out, but potentially try to to convince their parents that, that their way of epistemology or or um, coming to truth claims is the better one. Uh, there's a point in people's lives where they have to 
um, make certain decisions about the sort of people they want to be and what sort of lives they want they want to lead and what what conclusions they want to share with other people as a result of leading an examined life. These things are not easy. They're very, very, very difficult. Um, I would say to be very sincere with your parents when it comes to asking questions about why they believe what they believe. Um, and I think if you can, if parents can see why people have a problem with this, they're less likely to become angry in some cases. So I heavily modified that statement. I'm, he I'm hesitant to give universal advice because it depends on the religion, the parents, the relationship. But uh, as Guy P. Harrison, just someone asked him that question, he said, you know, ma make sure that your parents know that you love them and you care about them very much and make sure that that is always the basis of the relationship rather than epistemology. Yeah, uh, Richard Wade of uh, Friendly Atheists, um, and yeah. Richard also says something like that, sincerity and reminding your parents that you love them a lot. Uh, speaking of uh, families, um, you call faith a virus, and those who have faith um, are infected. So do you think that indoctrination is a form of child abuse? And to what degree? Like, should laws uh, be written to prevent parents from infecting their children? Uh, or should there be laws about inoculation? It's a great question. Dawkins believes that it's a form of child abuse. I think it's a form of child abuse. But just like racism, if somebody's a racist, you, you can't really make laws and ask, tell people not to be racist. They're still going to be racist. So the, the law in that sense doesn't do any good. In Chapter 9, I lay out a series of... Um, for exactly what you're talking about, these large-scale problems, um, containment protocols. How do we contain the spread of, of the faith virus so we can ultimately eradicate it? Um, one way is for uh, organizations that propagate faulty epistemologies to have their funding cut. Now, I don't know how it's, it is for you, their tax-exempt status, but in this country, it's pretty egregious. They, they, get, they receive t tremendous tax benefits. Um, but now there are certainly some cases like faith healing or what have you, then we have to step in and make laws, t to be sure. But it's not practical to make a law, it's not feasible uh, to make a law. Th th I just don't think that laws regulating what parents tell their children are the solution to the problem. They're not a containment protocol. I give, I think, 11 or 12 containment protocols. I think it's 11 um, containment protocols. I don't think making a law telling your, your a, a family not, not to indoctrinate their children into a superstition or to, to make them delusional will do any good. I see. Um, speaking of laws, um, it's when legislation is like hindered by faith and religion that the topic comes up of, of religion. So skeptics and secularists um, want to talk to people about their religion, when particularly because of um, a political impetus. But you particularly um, caution people from talking about politics. So, so is there some kind of special strategy when you're addressing both at the same time? Yeah, don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, so if, if you want to have a political conversation with someone, have a political conversation with someone. But if you want to conduct an intervention, conduct an intervention and don't bring politics into it. So you could have, so somebody can have all the political conversations that they, they want with as many people as they want, no problem. That's not an epistemological intervention. Okay. Um, of course, um, the Philippines was recently struck by a tragedy. Um, this is actually what the Conversations for Our Country is all about. We remind people to donate, to volunteer, and to do things that show that two hands working are better than just two hands clasping prayer. So, but, uh, that being said, some people uh, find value in the comfort that religion brings. And these people are the, the same ones who argue that when, when people go to religion, it's not really veracity or objectivity or truthfulness or scientific accuracy that they're looking for. It's more of a, a sense of belonging, a sense of some higher power taking care of them. 
And they say that science cannot provide this to them. It's only religion that can do this. So what is your response or your take on, on people who, who say this? Well, if, if you're looking for a sense of belonging, uh, you could do jujitsu. I get a lot of sense of belonging. You could join a chess club or bowling or uh, you, you could join a community activity that would give you a sense of belonging. You don't need to maintain a delusion to have a sense of belonging. Hmm, I see, I see. So, um, during times of tragedy, there's also this uh, prevailing attitude in some circles that it's wrong to criticize beliefs that inspire people to, to survive or to help others. So, beliefs such as religion or religious and nationalistic beliefs. So, do you agree with this sentiment that, that we should allow people to, to take what they can from these ideas? and then be productive with it before trying to, to argue against it and potentially hinder them from being as productive? It's a tricky question because you mix... Uh, there, there are different categories there. Nationalism, nationalism is an ideology. It's not an epistemology. So if people have an ideology and the ideology is, I love the Philippines or... Zimbabwe or wherever it is they love and that motivates them to help other people I don't I don't think that that's problematic what's problematic is that if people have an unreliable epistemology and then as a consequence of it, so if you have a way to come to knowledge or know the world that's <clears throat> not going to align your, that's basically arbitrary, that's not going to align your beliefs with reality, then if you happen to do something good as a result of that epistemology, if the question is, well then, should we, should we take away that epistemology so the person who was doing something good as a result of that epistemology will then no longer do something good? Um, I think that that's a flawed way of looking at the problem. I don't think that taking away a bad way to think about the world or a problem, um, I don't buy into that assumption that that's going to have a negative consequence. In fact, quite the contrary. I think it's going to have a positive consequence. Now, for sure, there could be people who do really good things, who have really screwed up epistemologies. I mean, no, no question about it, That's that just seems, um, at face value, that seems to be true. The question is, well, what do we do about those people? Um, in the case of the Philippines right now, you're, you're suffering from a terrible, terrible catastrophe. You know, the, the, the damage and the lives and the property and how long it's going to take those poor people to get back on their feet, I, I certainly don't have an answer to that. But the way to deal with a catastrophe like that is through science and reason and rationality. It's not through praying about having clean water. It's through bringing clean water and using the tools of science so that people People can get clean water. It's through um, talking about. Um, it's it's through acting upon the results of the scientific method to make people's lives better. It's not through delusion. Uh, yeah. Um, on this same topic, um, you touched about this a bit earlier when you said that that there were other things in philosophy that you wanted to work on, but first you wanted to work on this particular problem. Yeah. There are people who who are. Um, kind of going for the low-hanging fruit. I mean, the, the those things that get immediate results. Like, I, yeah. I had a conversation with, with Hammond a while ago. Yeah. He was saying that he focused more on the consequences, like getting people to be less fundamentalist or less less extremist. And he doesn't particularly care whether they, they lose their faith. He just wants to look for for things that he can work with, together with, um, even with people with faith so do you think that what do you think about that kind of thinking that let's let's just focus on those goals that we can agree on um, no no let's let's not focus on the fact that we don't agree on epistemologies um, our time would be better spent like on doing things that make an immediate impact rather than on on faith which e even in my perspective is not really that Influential in the everyday everyday lives of people, it doesn't have that much practical consequence. I mean, at the end of the day, 
I, I, I've often said that we're all practically atheists in the way that we behave. So what's your take on this? If, if he not or, or somebody else wants to get the lowest of the low-hanging fruit and help people not to become fundamentalists, I have no problem with that. I don't, I'm not going to sit here and tell you, Red, that there's one that who, you know, you should speak to these people or don't speak to these people or this guy over here, he has a great project and this guy just does this or does this. We all make our contribution to reason and rationality. This is, I would hope, one of my contributions. I, um, yeah, yeah, so I, I don't think that there's a right or a wrong or a good or a bad contribution to make. You know, I'm not a biologist. Jerry Coyne makes his contribution by uh, do, fighting, um, you know, a lot of, yeah. So, I mean, that, that's, I'm not suited to do that. I mean, so different people bring their skill sets to bear to help people be more reasonable and more rational. I don't think that there's a... I don't think that everybody should be doing what I'm doing or I should be doing what he not doing. I, I just, people bring their own skill sets to bear. I agree. Um, if people eventually buy your book, lots of people, and I, I see that happening actually. I think it's a, it's a very good book. So let lots of people become street epistemologists. The process becomes refined and people practice and they become so good at it that they can, can do the conversions in 10 minutes or less. Um, do you see any potential negative consequences of this? Like, um, of course, religion has been called the opium of the of the masses, and and it's a it's a drug. And if you um, get people out of a drug, like withdrawal tends to happen sometimes. Do you do you foresee some kind of uh, consequence like this happening in in this case? No. Okay. <laughs> good, good answer. Good answer. Because that's what, what a lot of people actually fear. It's often projected fears, like not fears for themselves, but fears of other people when they say that if people lose their faith, then they'll suddenly start murdering each other or raping okay. each other. Okay, right. I talk about that in Chapter 7, uh, and the one word answer to that is Scandinavia. Yeah, I agree. And... Uh, People like uh, Zuckerberg, I mean uh, Zuckerman. Phil Zuckerman. Zuck Zuckerman has some great stuff on that. His work is in the deep, deep, deeper section of my book. Yeah, great, great. So atheist churches are growing a number. It's a recent trend. What, what's your take on this? The I think they're called Sunday assemblies. Uh, I don't really have any take on it. Um, um, I have. I I don't think I could add anything productive. I went to a mega church. Uh, a couple of weeks ago and, and uh, interviewed people from there um, and there's no question about it there's a sense of community they had this big clock on the wall and I think they set it to four minutes I mean it was massive and uh, it was on a screen and he had to talk to people for four minutes I went to Catholic Mass a little bit when I was a kid and he turned to someone and said peace be with you peace be with you but you didn't get to know him and so there's no question in these things there's a community aspect in the, and it's community oriented um, but I really don't know anything about they asked me to speak at the Sunday Assembly here in Oregon but I don't know anything about I just don't know enough about it I, you know I don't really I don't really read blogs or follow popular news stories. I don't really know who the movers and shakers are in the community. I basically read books and peer-reviewed literature about pretty technical, specific stuff. I don't follow atheism so much as a social movement. Um, yeah, I don't know, you know any of the big personalities or what they do or don't do. I just read a lot of peer-reviewed stuff. That, that's, that informs me. So but I don't really know about the Sunday assemblies. You at least heard of um, how Pope Francis is shaking up the, the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah. Like, yeah, and um, he's shaking Catholicism in a more uh, decent direction, I think, than his uh, predecessor. And um, just a hypothetical question. Let's say that religion becomes kind of like a... Like a more of a spiritual rather than a dogmatic thing, you know how when people say spiritual, it's more of a a, a metaphorical kind of uh, worship rather than a literal. And post post theistic. Like, yeah, 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 they become like um, unitarians or 
your or Episcopalians, and yeah. they're they're more benevolent. Like their their faith doesn't cause them to harm others or to harm themselves. Okay. Uh, would you still um, put as much effort into doing the interventions as you are now? No, probably not as much. I probably wouldn't have uh, if we lived in that kind of world. I probably wouldn't have started this whole project in, in, in the first place. Uh, but as long as they make supernatural claims, you know, the, the Dalai Lama could be the nicest guy in the world, and I'm, I'm sure he is. He's a very, very nice man. Either that, he has a good PR machine. But that doesn't give him license to pretend that he reincarnates. Um, and if the Pope was such a nice guy... I think he's hoodwinking everybody. Then the first thing he'd do is he'd release the names to the police in every jurisdiction in the world of all the child rapists and pedophiles and all the people who allowed children to be raped over and over again and moved to different parishes. So it's a smokescreen. And this guy has hoodwinked people into thinking he's some kind of a great man of charity. If you were a great, decent, kind man, then every single one of those monsters who rape children would be in bars behind bars and he would be the one doing it so until he does that every gesture and every action means nothing thank you for 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 that uh any final words i mean what's next for 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 this project you already mentioned about that tv show that sounds very exciting like any new books that you're working on or maybe yeah, i have a uh, for you know speed of yeah technology? So I have a game about critical thinking coming out with Elbow Fish, and uh, that's going to be pretty fun. It's a card game. <clears throat> I uh, I'm doing the TV show, which is going to be. <laughs> I mean, I'm 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 not going to sell it. I will let the trailer speak for itself. The footage is just. I mean, it it is just. My producer said to me that the footage is so good that people aren't going to believe it. People are going to think that the conversations, you know, that they're scripted or they're plants or there's no, there are no actors in this. It's to totally legit. So that, um, John Loftus, John W. Loftus has asked me to do a chapter. Um, Christian, he'd be a good person to have one. Christianity is not great off the Christian Hitchens. I'm going to do that. Um... Those are my three immediate. I have other projects, but those are my uh, those are my immediate projects right now. I'm working with the London Atheists to uh, you know work on street epistemology to help people with their interventions. Um, I have some other medium term plans, but the game and the TV show and the book chapter are next on my list. So, so you know, not many people, I don't know how it is over there, but not many people in this country are big readers. That's why I think the TV show is going to be so important. I think it's going to be so important because hopefully I can reach more people and teach more people how to con conduct interventions to help people out of faith and into reason than a book will. And I think the book will legitimize the TV show. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, and then, and then again, of course, my writing partner and I are, uh, I write science fiction screenplays. We, uh, we're, we continue to write those regularly. So, uh, you know, I have, I have my hands full. Yeah, you seem to be very productive. And yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's very inspiring, the, the kind of work that you do. Um, any final words to all of our listeners and viewers and potential and actual street epistemologists all over the world yeah my, my f little, a f few words I, I want to say I'm incredibly sorry about the uh, tragedy that's hit Fil Filipinos I am um, don't have much um, interaction with the Filipino community I, I I did do Filipino martial arts stick fighting for years and years and years uh, Dorobio Escrima so uh, yeah yeah, so I did that, and I loved it, and I um, <clears throat> met some incredibly uh, nice, unbelievably talented people with a stick in their hand, very dangerous people. <laughs> um, so the first thing I want to say is, I'm, I'm obviously, I'm sorry for that, and uh, um, hopefully that, that, that folks in that area will get back on their feet and the international community will offer assistance I know that the uh, damage is very very extensive I was watching videos and it's just a horrible horrible catastrophe <clears throat> so that's 
that's the first thing I want to say. So, second thing I want to say is uh, study the. Uh, it's not enough to just get the book. Really really use the techniques don't start slow you, know, you can wait until people come to you um, because we can turn the tide of unreason and superstition and we can re reclaim what I would like to see as a new enlightenment where reason and rationality flourish but the only way to do that it's not going to be to count from systems on high laws governments I think that's the bad way to think about it or less productive way than individual interventions we all have to take a stake, a stake in this. Um, and the final thing I wanted to say is I just wanted to thank you for what you're doing and for, you know, you're a great conduit for the uh, free thinking community there in the, in the Philippines. It's what you're doing a tremendous work and important work and that's your contribution. You're all, we're all make, trying to make a contribution to make our society more reasonable and more rational and you've done some wonderful, wonderful interviews. I mean, this interview is obviously a test, testament to that because you were so well prepared and such great questions. So, thanks. Thank you for that, uh, Peter, and thank you so much for your for your time. Um, My pleasure. And uh, yeah, I hope to talk to you next time. And to to all of our viewers, to people who are watching, us remember what what uh, Peter said. Um, get his book; um, it's very good. And also, do remember to to donate and to volunteer, raise awareness, do every bit that you can. We all have a stake in in this. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you, Red. And